Hi, good morning. Uh, I think it'd be good if uh, all the panelists, except for Dr. Blade, Stan, we have heard from you already, but the other uh, panelists, uh, Matt and Melissa and Glenn, each take two minutes to tell us what you do uh, and how it relates to what we're going to discuss today about education, agricultural education, and healthy living. Sure. <clears throat> Since you know, call my name first, I'll I'll jump in. Um, yes. uh, my name is Matt Baker, and uh, oops, I'm sorry. My name is Matt Baker. I'm department head and professor at Texas A&M University. Um, when Stan Blake was talking about uh, his great presentation talking through this great presentation uh i've kind of lived through what we call the green book or the 1988 um, national council national research council report on ag literacy i'm really good friends with marty frick who you quoted he still settle as one of my former students uh who you who quoted so and carrie trexler is a good friend who's now at university of california davis so um, yeah, I've had the opportunity to work in this great discipline all of my career. At Texas A&M, we have over 800 students in our department who study uh, and prepare to work with youth in different venues. Um, we have a minor in youth development. We have a teacher certification program to provide teachers to our almost 100,000 students enrolled in agriculture courses and public schools. We work closely with Extension and their 4-H program in Texas. Uh, we also prepare ag communicators and I have two fantastic communicators who are working in this whole idea of public trust and how can we as, as university faculty reestablish trust or establish trust uh, among our audiences and one is working in an area which I think is pretty fascinating, and she calls it goodwill. Mm. How do we, how do we as scientists, uh, personify goodwill um, among our stakeholders? And I think that's really interesting. Um, and then also we prepare leadership educators, uh, mm. people who go out and work. Many of them go into management positions in agribusiness when they finish. So. Um, yeah, it's, and 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 in our department, uh, and most of us are academics. I think we put a lot of emphasis on communicating our own science. So, yes. annual evaluations. I I really encourage uh, getting your research out in public forums, making your research available in open publishing venues, making your research available. Um, in ResearchGate, Google Scholars, the the normal venues, as well as posting about your research in your Twitter accounts, LinkedIn, et cetera. And with me here in College Station tonight is Dr. Jayan and um, Dr. Pong Lu. Pong is, has looked re very recently at the importance of consumers in, in particular meat products. Uh, and, and the trust they feel when scientists themselves communicate with them. And I don't think we do a very good job of that. And Jay's looking at uh, altmetric data, which looks at the impact of the, in social engagement with our research. So uh, that's kind of who I am and what we do here at yep. Texas A&M. Okay, thank you, Matt. Melissa? Oh, hi, everyone. Um, Melissa Welsh, uh, Melissa Lydon Welsh. I currently teach at the University of Maryland. I head up the Agricultural and Extension Education Program. So that encompasses our undergraduate students that are preparing to become agricultural educators, um, our students who are interested in working with nonprofits or NGOs or just in general um, farm sites that want to educate the public or work with um, educating groups in terms of activities they might do. Um, and then we also have a new master's of extension education program. And so that is more geared towards our individuals that are looking to become extension educators. So the land grants um, system that we have across the United States and how those individuals uh, fulfill the mission of the land grant system. Um, but on the other side of it, I have a lot of students that come through that or well, we just started, <laughs> but 
most of the students we have currently in the program, um, they work in different sectors of agriculture. So I have some conservation um, districts, uh, individuals who they work with natural resources, and they're looking at how to connect with different other agricultural entities. I myself, um, born and raised on a farm, so I have a very practical approach to uh, ag education. Um, I'm a certified family consumer science educator. So from the very beginning, I've always taught individuals uh, where their food comes from in terms of what it does down the line, whether that's you know being turned into some kind of cell product that they're going to wear as a garment or use as a, a, a upholstery type of item, and the principles and properties that are important um, with those different types of fibers and textures. Over to the nutritional side of you know why you and how you select foods and how they're prepared. And you know, more recently, of course, my graduate work um, was focused on the motivation of uh, research scientists to share their graduate students that were research science focused to share their research with K-12 audiences. So helping them um, translate what they do into palatable bits of information. And now in my position, I, I teach a, a graduate course for our research students in terms of teaching and translating what they do. And it's interesting because um, a lot of them that come from different backgrounds of how they were educated, of course, they want to teach how they were taught and recognizing just those small differences in how people approach information and their perceptions um, from what they understand to how to examine it from a different perspective can sometimes be very challenging, especially in um, the idea that you know, this, this, this food item that, that you may be very elementary think of how it's produced, um, there's a lot of science that goes on behind you know, that fact. Um, so that's what I tried to do, I tried to spell myths. Thank you. Glenn, over to you. What do you do in the Philippines? In the Hello, good morning here. Actually, I'm in Bangkok now, flying to oh, the okay. Philippines. Okay. Yeah, I, I thank you, Stan, for that uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we know each other, Stan. We were in IATA 15 years ago. I, I think our kids are in school together, and it's nice seeing you, Stan. Here. I hope you could, I, we could visit you there. Um, I'm Glenn Gregorio. Actually, now I have, uh, I have been with the International Rice Research Institute for 29 years. Then I joined a private company, East West Seed Company. Then after three years, I joined back the University of the Philippines at Los Banos as a professor of the Institute of Crop Science, where I teach uh, plant breeding and genetics. And currently, I have been a second man at the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture. It's a mouthful. So our territory, actually, it's an international organization uh, for Southeast Asia, uh, including Timor-Leste. So I have 11 countries with me as my territory, but we go beyond that one. Actually, I just came from Indonesia uh, a few days ago, and we have this. Uh, it's interesting to share that we have this. Uh, uh, Southeast Asian University Consortium for Graduate Education on Agriculture and Natural Resources, which may interest you because we have the elite universities of Southeast Asia, because Southeast Asia is uh, uh, unique while Stan is talking about Canada, all those farms. In Southeast Asia, we have small farmers, so it's a different way of communicating. So I like the stance saying that we have to create trust, trust to the farmers, because sometimes we in the academy, they look us up with a different way. You are just talking about tourists, but we have to show that we are farmers like me. I'm also a farmer. So this is uh, what I'm saying, the Southeast Asian Regional Center for Graduate Study and Research in Agriculture, which I'm leading right now, is having this 11 five-year plan, which we call it Attain Accelerating Transformation Through Agricultural Innovation, where we saw the need to rethink how we approach things, particularly in terms how we view our agriculture, how we view food, and how we view uh, food production. We strongly believe that we that systematic or systemic integrated innovation requires new mindset of thinking, making farming not only as a production per se, but it should be an agribusiness so that the small farmer starts to realize that they should not go on to change of mindset. Uh, uh, where farming is viewed as sustainable agribusiness. So we believe on that and we are now actually, uh, Southeast, uh, the Circa is now looking at carbon-wise agriculture where I know in the West you are doing it, we are still in the survival states, but we're going to that phase where everyone's talking about 
circular economy, agriculture 4.0, uh, sustainable agriculture. So we are doing that, initiating that in Southeast Asia. I'll, I'll stop on that. Yes. But uh, what I'm saying Thank is you. we have to inform the from the kids to the policymakers about agriculture. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to turn our attention to the theme of to, today's uh, panel discussion, which is the nexus between healthy living and agricultural education. And the next thing beyond that is, uh, you know, how do we fuel it? You know, you know, how do you fuel the healthy living through uh, agricultural education? So I want to hear from the panelists, the how and, you know, how has it taken effect? Uh, how does the relationship work? Of course, healthy living obviously leads to greater purchases of the right kind of food and fiber. Uh, but what do you do to do it? Uh, for example, when when uh, Dr. Blade was sharing in his in his talk, the the the, the assumption is across the whole spectrum. Uh, perhaps each of you could take certain sectors and tell, say, how do you do it in schools? How do you do it in your universities? How how have your uh, agricultural educators actually gone out to society? You know, what's their impact? I'd love to hear about that. Please go ahead. Sam. Thanks very much. And thank you to my panelists. And I have to say, Glenn, it's uh, so fantastic to see you. You look younger and I look older. So it seems very unfair somehow uh, how this has been arranged. Um, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tan, for that question. I, I will use a very small example. We have a significant amount of poultry research that goes on within our faculty. And one of the things that our researchers, our graduate students have found great value in is in maintaining uh, heritage breeds. Uh, now, if we know the poultry industry, it's, you know, the genetics are fairly uh, straightforward and quite uniform, but there has been a, a, a value in maintaining these, these heritage breeds. Of course, that comes with a cost. But what we've done over the past period of time, and I give all of the credit to, to my great colleagues within the faculty, was to come up with a, an adopt the hen kind of an arrangement. People actually pay money in, they start to get a picture of one of those hens in our research flock. Uh, and then they also have the opportunity to collect eggs over a period of time. And these aren't the usual eggs that we would see, uh, you know, in a North American supermarket. These are speckled, these are brown, these are of various sizes because of the classical nature of the genetics. Uh, but we have had a, a tremendous pickup from the media. People love this idea that the community is investing in something where they get a tangible benefit of some eggs, but they also start to understand why it's important to have the genetics from several decades back in poultry. Uh, our graduate students get involved, our undergrads get involved. We have visits from K to 12 groups. I know it's just a very thin slice, but it's just finding those ways to connect. And this is one way that we seem to have incorporated uh, and been able to, to, to link to almost all of the groups that I, that I spoke about uh, today. Uh, anyone yeah. else? Okay, go ahead, maybe, Yes. Uh, maybe I could uh, chip in. Actually, what we are doing right now, we 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 have this um, agri museum where we call it sharing, share a hub for agriculture and rural innovation for the next generation. We are where we are sh showcasing the new technologies in agriculture to to change the mindset of the children. And we have also a Lego cafe in our center where we just launched it last, uh, actually these two were launched only two, month, uh, two months ago, three months ago. We have a Lego cafe where the, where the theme is smart agriculture, where the younger kids, even the older ones could go there and play. We have our robotics there and we are involving robotics with the smart agriculture. And another way also of teaching is we have this uh, innovation Olympics where we have, we have a hackathon where we have the uh, planetary health diet as a theme where we could get the local food and there will be a contest starting right now. So I'm just giving you some few examples of how to make agriculture sexy, how to make agriculture enticing, and nutrition should be there. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa? Yeah, I'll speak to the elementary uh, K-12 setting. Uh, in the state of Maryland and across the U.S., we have a lot of initiatives um, to help students, especially ones that are so far removed 
the farm that they see how production takes place just in a small sample set. So um, you'll see vertical gardens in the school systems. You'll see uh, um, leaf towers or or, or um, some of the things that, that we're starting to see in Maryland, aquaculture um, projects that the students do. And the idea behind it, oh, and, oh, and, and school gardens. Um, and the, one of the big obstacles we had um, doing this was to help the students and also the faculty kind of see the, the simple production of it, but then the larger part of the system, right? So those schools to be able to serve those vegetables that were straight from the garden that they knew what they were putting there, they had to understand the safe serve certifications and they had to understand the um, uh, gap training. So good agricultural practice training that all of our farmers are, are uh, required to do to provide produce, uh, fresh produce to markets. And so to be able to take produce simply from their school gardens, to be able to serve it in their classrooms or serve it in their cafeterias, the students start to see that whole system approach to how that works and all the different um, intersections and areas in which you could see food illness or food um, concerns you know, pop up. And then how does those, those different stages affect the quality of those particular food items, right? So at the very start, what kind of substrate or what kind of soil they, are they using um, to, to grow those particular items? Um, the care and handling of how the, of the item is picked, the optimal timing of when it's picked. And so the students get that firsthand practical. It's a very rudimentary um, look at it, but it gives them a, a sense and a taste of what it takes to get that food product from that original field area, whatever it may be, whether it's inside a building somewhere or if it's actually out in a field, to their, to their table. And so with that, we also look at the career links to that, right? So students get to see like, oh, if I really like this section or sector of agriculture, what are the types of careers that I could go into? And again, we're focused on um, in those environments, what kind of things would you be exposed to in that work environment? So healthy living revolved around the entire system of food production and also mm -hmm. looking at um, potential career interests linked to that. Matt, any comments on that one? Yeah, I think the most exciting thing we have going at Texas A&M is a new institute for advancing health through agriculture okay. um, that Patrick Stover is leading. Patrick is the dean who hired me to come in here and work with this particular program. And I serve as an internal advisory board member for that particular initiative. Patrick has big dreams about uh, developing new food standards, uh, particularly in terms of uh, using ag to combat disease and human disease. Uh, I think he's focusing much of his attention right now on diabetes and problems that we have in the United States and Texas with being overweight. He's tying that through responsive agriculture and what can we do to uh, keep agriculture economically viable, but being responsive to society's needs and through healthy living. And I know we have mobile units working with uh, prenatal women, um, monitoring their health that, um, and providing advice to them um, and doing randomized trials in communities. And that's pretty exciting to take our research out into the field. It's the same principle that we've been using for years and years and years in ag when we take when we have field trials, but we're doing it with people. And we find that very exciting. Okay. That's that's interesting. The the part the the responsible agriculture, the supply side towards uh, providing healthy food for healthy living. Uh, I'm curious, um, have there been measures in the outcomes in terms of what you do in schools you mentioned uh school gardens and you know i think that's a program that across in the, promoted in schools in america so have there been studies on the outcomes does it actually translate to healthier choices made by by the students later in life or something would you all know Any so in our um snap ed program uh, uh -huh. nutritional program um, and that's again another national program. What we see is that the introduction of students to um, vegetables and fruits that they've never tasted before, we we have found that that does increase their consumption. That's across the board. Doesn't matter what age group you're talking about. Um, typically, also we look at um, the preparation of the particular food. So talking about okay, what's 
the maybe the more healthy way to prepare this food if your family does have diabetes or if your family has issues with high cholesterol things like that so the pre method of preparation of of um preparing it for the family um the other aspect of it too that we have to also keep in mind always is the economic concerns that these individuals face right so the ability for them to be able to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables um, from farmers markets um, and the viability of that in certain areas where you know the season is very short um, and so how how do schools and how do other entities in the area it's like in maryland we have a very plentiful supply of fruits and vegetables um considerable amount of year as compared to if you look at the northern states in the united states you know the dakotas um their growing season and obviously they're looking at more so interior type of you know um container garden, things like that. Um. Um, yeah, I just speak in, we have, I, I don't know if I mentioned, we have a, another program, which is the school plus home garden program uh -huh. where, where we introduce gardening in the schools and it has an impact. It has started with the pilot farms and it's now extended to different provinces and even in Cambodia and extended into school plus home garden uh, come biodiversity enhancement and entrepreneurship so and enterprise which is now you can see the the program is getting uh, bigger and bigger and it has impacted some of the feeding program in schools that's uh i may say if you do it in southeast asia like mm. philippines vietnam thailand uh, cambodia timor leste it has a very big impact because you can see the impact from the stunted growth to a better growth where uh, where where children are, are exposed to planting and all the more they will be eating uh, vegetables and one thing we we are also promoting is the breastfeeding which is the basic food yeah. breastfeeding which is really uh, very important to the kids and uh, the families because you don't need to buy formula you have to have uh, the natural way of feeding and nutrition for the first 1000 days for the kids thank you very much okay i've been told by the organizers we only have about a minute left but i can't help but ask all the panelists to say what if you had your wish list what could the policy makers do to improve <clears throat> this system you know where we can fuel healthy living through agricultural education because <clears throat> stan you said you know speech all the definitions talk about the system so i suppose systems boil down to policy makers what could they do be doing better uh, a few seconds from each of you I've used so much time, so I will leave it to others, but I would just go back to that trust piece. I'm not sure that uh -huh. the policymakers can do that. I think we have to all work okay. towards that trusting relationship. Okay. Matt? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll glom on to that too. I think really the, the bigger mis, the, the biggest mistrust clearly is with agribusiness uh -huh. and large scale agribusiness. And I, I, I think policymakers need to work with agribusiness to help help send the message that we're all in this together. They're not evil people just trying to make money. They are actually trying to help people. And we really need to get that message out. I think it's easy for our scientists to communicate trust. I think it's easy for our producers to communicate trust. I think it's very challenging for uh, large-scale agribusiness yeah. to communicate trust. That's true. Um, yeah, for me, I, we should go back to, especially in the Southeast Asian context, we, yes. I, we are advocating the academe, industry, government interconnectivity. I think this is where we could work together. The local government should be there. The industry should be there. That's why I always go to stands. Yes. It should be the trust of everyone. Thank you. Okay. Final word from Melissa. Yeah, so I think one of the things that our policymakers um, kind of miss the mark on is working with the, the grassroots groups that are already there to help mm -hmm. connect them to consumers and producers. So Common Ground, for example, is a group that uh, helps producers, farmers tell their, their story and to help them sit down at the table and talk about, you know, what really are the concerns that those producers, you know, have and, and how they're impacted by the decisions that consumers make that are fueled by myths, right? And so obviously there's a business side to even the smallest of farms in which the individual has to make the choice as to whether they're going to go conventional method or if they're going to use a, an organic practice that maybe it doesn't really fit 
the, the, the practice that they have, right? But how to communicate that to the, the consumers to understand that just for example, just because something's labeled organic does not mean that there's not some kind of pesticide that's used. It's a different type, it's a different style. So helping our consumers understand that whenever they, their first introduction to agriculture is, you know, a, a toy a farm with some little plastic animals and not understanding like that, that you know, full science that's behind it, but making it a palatable type of um, area. I think that's where the policymakers, they use the, the, the industries as their, um, their fallout guy all the time. Okay, thank you very much, panelists. It looks like uh, in order to do better, we have to foster trust uh, tr among all the stakeholders. You know, so long as any one of them does have this element of distrust, we have an issue. Thank you all. I'm going to hand over to Chloe, who's going to take over for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tan and all panelists for the wonderful discussion.